Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of the big picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. A new type of American military base is quietly moving into the backyards of communities throughout the country. At this base, you will find the Nike, the Army's first guided missile system to defend American cities against aerial attack. Now, the establishment of a Nike installation not far from a residential area means problems of adjustment for the local community. For a story on what happens when a guided missile installation moves into a typical American town, we took our big picture camera to Upper Marlboro, Maryland, where not very long ago, a Nike base was established. From Washington, it is only a few minutes by air to the town of Upper Marlboro. Viewed from the skies, the Maryland countryside, a peaceful green spotted here and there with white frame houses, is like many others across the face of America. And at first glance, there seems nothing unusual about B Battery of the 75th Anti-Aircraft Artillery Missile Battalion. It has all the looks of a well-set-up army post. There are the usual barracks, trim and neat, where the men wake up in the morning, where they sack out at night. And in between, they use a lot of elbow grease to keep themselves and their weapons spick and span and ready for anything. Walk into the mess hall, through the kitchens where the cooks prepare three hot meals a day, into the eating area. Nothing different. It could be any mess hall from Maine to California, or for that matter, many an overseas station too. In the rec hall, some men queue them up while others take the cue just to sit and read. But it is at headquarters, hearing a certain word across the desks, that you get a sense of why this outfit is new, different. The word is Nike. Nike is a guided missile, which, aided by a team of radar locating devices, can be fired into the air to destroy an airborne enemy target. The men of Battery B are ready 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Upon them may depend the fate of thousands of people in the nation's capital nearby. Whether it is in the painstaking fueling techniques or countless other precision operations, training is their job. Training and more training. At the launching area, automatic elevators raise these giant needles of destruction from underground concrete boxes to vertical firing position. Rising in one of these elevators was the battery commander, whom I was waiting to interview. I'm Sergeant Queen. Glad to meet you, sir. And what can I do for you? Captain, we're very interested in Nike because we know it's going to be in our backyards. I wonder if you would explain just exactly what Nike is. Nike is a supersonic, liquid-fueled, anti-aircraft missile. It's approximately 20 feet long and has, is about one foot in diameter. It has two sets of fins, one for steering and guidance. The missile and the booster weigh a little over a ton. Normally, the Nike is launched from a vertical position and can mean an attack from any direction. Captain Carlos, as a battery commander, uh, I wonder if you could tell us, without revealing classified information, of course, just how the Army goes about defending any given area. The broad picture is not classified. 
In general terms, you build a ring of Nike sites around the area to be defended, such as this site in the Upper Marlboro area, aids in the defense of Washington, D.C. The number of sites depends upon the size of the area to be defended and the availability of terrain. I judge that there is something other than arbitrary choice that determines where an individual Nike site is to go. That is right. The characteristics of the weapon and the terrain practically dictate to the anti-aircraft command where to locate the sites. Were there any particular problems in your case? Problems? There were many, Sergeant Queen. Housing for the married men of the unit, recreation, and a feeling of acceptance of our battery by the men of the community. Let's drive in Upper Marlboro and get a first-hand report from the townspeople themselves. Upper Marlboro is a town of about 1,000 population. Founded over 200 years ago, it is a community steeped in American tradition. Though its roots may be in the past, Upper Marlboro is very much a part of today. You see this in the imposing buildings on the main street, in the auction tobacco warehouses, in the comfortable hotel, in the fine up-to-date schools, and the bright-eyed children who walk out of them. The weekly newspaper has been published for the last 100 years and is still going strong. And of course, there is the volunteer fire department, 35 townsmen and three fire engines, and lots of spirit. Yes, tradition with a forward look. That's the story of Upper Marlboro. Chief of the volunteer fire department is the town postmaster. So our first stop was the town post office. And the first person we talked to was the postmaster. Pete Dorsey, by name. Pete, this is Sergeant Queen. How do you do, Mr. Dorsey? Glad to know you, Sergeant. He's here with a big picture camera to get the story on our problems in community relations. Mr. Dorsey, Captain Collis has told us that he anticipated many problems in the acceptance of his Nike battery by your townspeople. What was the general reaction? Well, first, of course, is the movement of new people into the community particularly soldiers in this case, an influx of new people in a small community as old as this one certainly creates a lot of problems. They're not always acceptable in a great many of instances, strictly by the local people. Second, of course, was the danger involved in the use of the weapon. Very few people knew anything about Nike or any such thing as that. There was a great deal of apprehension about how dangerous it was to the townspeople and to the adjoining population. And third, of course, it was always a problem of whose land was going to be taken to put these uh, installations on. That was one problem that confronted just those people who live in that area. Now, for these people who had opposed the army moving in on them, what was their immediate reaction to Captain Collis' visit? Well, it was, his talk was quite an eye-opener. He dispensed any uh, theories about apprehension of the soldiers by stating that his men were highly picked, uh, highly trained men. Secondly, that the weapons were not dangerous. They were for our protection and would not endanger our lives or our property. And third, that not as much land would be taken as people had been led to believe by unfounded sources. Fortunately, at this meeting, in addition to having representatives from all the businesses in town, from the farmers, we had as our guests all the teachers of the public school system in Upper Marlboro. But weren't there other groups to turn to for help, Captain? When I came to town, I made a particular point of contacting the ministers, two of them in the Upper Marlboro area and one in the Croom area. To each of them, I said, I'm going to need your help. What kind of help did you need from them? Housing, housing for the married men of the unit. Housing doesn't come easy in a small town, especially when it must be within a few minutes distance of the Nike site. But somehow there are always public spirited citizens like Mrs. J. Letcher Shaw. Mrs. Shaw, you were, of course, interested in the family problem that these men moving to the site were going to have. Where were they going to put their families? What were you able to do in this? Well, I was able to do very little personally, but I did contact people, and the people that I heard that had even a room to rent, because I felt that these boys were coming into a strange neighborhood, and I have a son-in-law who is in the Air Corps, and I know what difficulties they've had with housing problems. So every time I heard of 
anything at all, I would telephone Captain Collis and I'd also get in touch with the people and give them his telephone number so that they might be able to work out something that way. Across the road from the Nike site is the farm of Frank Weibel. His attitude toward the men of Company B is typical. This last summer, when I was busy on the farm, some of the men came over and gave me relief, helping to cut the back. It was all good workers, fine men. I think this battery is a great uh, thing to our community, and all things, also think it's great for the defense of our capital, Washington City. I met one, one of the men there, the Sergeant Harris, which is engaged to my daughter. I think he's a very fine man. And also, all the men that I have been com communicated with so far. When no adequate off-post housing is available, the Army will construct it. Quite a few soldier families, however, choose to live in trailers. Farmers like Frank Weibel are glad to make the necessary arrangements for electricity, water, and sewage disposal. And the price is always a fair one. Gradually, with the passage of time, the Nike soldiers began to be accepted as regular members of the community. They were encouraged to participate in town functions and recreational activities, like hunting, for example. Privately owned duck blinds and hunting areas were not off limits to the men of Battery B. A truck pulls into the base. Just one example of the other side of the coin. Soldier cooperation with town activities. A Boy Scout troop is co-sponsored by the men of the battery, and the youngsters are frequently invited for some supervised play. It may be basketball, but the scout's favorite is usually arts and crafts. The kids have the run of the battery hobby shop, and under the watchful eyes of their soldier scoutmasters, they learn all about doing it yourself. And a happy ending to this short report on Upper Marlboro. Not very long ago, there was a wedding and reception. The happy couple, Mr. Wyville's daughter and a soldier of Battery B, whose buddies, along with his many friends from town, turn out to wish him well. It's a safe bet that Captain Collis felt mighty good about it too, because this wedding in its way was kind of a symbol of the closeness between civilian and soldier in the upper Marlboro area. It's not only a matter of soldiers there to do a job. It is more than that. It is a sense of working together toward a common goal, the peace and well-being of America, now and for the future. From a Nike installation in Maryland, we move across the Atlantic for our next big picture story, to Western Europe. Heart of Western Europe's defenses against possible aggression is NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Throughout the year, NATO is maintained on a combat-ready basis. Hardly a month goes by without a realistic land, sea, and air maneuver, in which new concepts of defense and counterattack are thoroughly tested. In our next big picture story, we will see the highlights of the NATO maneuvers of 1955. Nineteen fifty-five saw the free world gain considerable strength as the fourteen nations of the North Atlantic community were joined in a common defense by the Federal Republic of Germany. Nineteen fifty-five also saw NATO maneuvers test new concepts of defense using highly mobile land, sea and air forces all armed with atomic weapons.
Along the 4,000-mile defensive arc from Norway to Turkey, each nation and each area presents a different problem. In the mountains of Norway, as observed in Exercise Mitzkogen, the fighting man is faced with a rugged terrain and a bitterly cold climate. Special emphasis is placed on the movement of men and equipment in sub-zero weather. In the presence of Crown Prince Olaf, ski troopers demonstrate their maneuverability. Tanks trundle through the snow from dawn till dusk. Fifteen hundred miles away in Turkey and the Aegean Sea, NATO forces fought a series of battles and exercised Red Trident against a mythical enemy attacking from the north. Turkish and American naval forces fight off attacking submarines and jet bombers. Ground troops test the defense of northeast Turkey against the heavy blows of an aggressor. With the help of land and sea-based aircraft, they launch powerful counterattacks. In Red Trident, U.S. Marines kick off with an assault landing at Saros Bay. Once ashore, they drive inland to link up with the Turkish First Army. During these short but important maneuvers, all arms and services are tested. Watching everything are high-ranking NATO officers from many nations. NATO tank gunnery range in Germany, men of the armed forces test fire their weapons. This is the largest range of its kind in Western Europe, and Netherland tankers make good use of it. These units are equipped with hard-hitting 50-ton Centurion tanks, among the finest tanks in the world. Italian land forces were put through stiff tests in August. The setting was the rugged mountains of northern Italy and the Venetian plain. During exercise Lake Major, ground forces included the tough Versaleri. Regular Italian infantry. Armor. Alpine troops and service and support units. Greek, Turkish and Italian F-84 Thunder Jets furnish close support from Italian bases. Meanwhile, American fighters operate from carriers cruising in the Adriatic. The battle opens with an enemy invading northeast Italy. NATO airmen gain air superiority and cut off enemy lines of communication. Ground troops swing into action. A powerful counterattack is launched. Under a protective blanket of air cover, tank and infantry columns advance along the Venetian plain. Their northern flank is protected by Alpine troops blocking the mountain passes. Throughout the attack, service and support units keep pace with the combat troops. In the upper Piave Valley, the Alpine units mop up remaining pockets of resistance. Meanwhile, armored spearheads hammer the main enemy forces. They reach the Tagliamento, and the battle is won. In the Luxembourg Army maneuvers, Luxembourg units went through some rugged training in September. The combat troops are formed and operate in groups composed of an infantry battalion, an artillery battery, and a heavy mortar platoon, as well as a medical platoon and a transportation platoon. At the same time, signal, reconnaissance, and engineer units train independently.
As observers watch, the mobile defense of a broad front is practiced by all units. NATO air forces must be alert at all times. Their job is to counter the initial shock of aggression. To give them realistic training, a vast maneuver is held in June, exercise carte blanche in the skies over western Germany. Directing the operation is NATO's Central Air Command at Fontainebleau in France. Three thousand aircraft from eleven nations take part. Until the last minute, neither command knows which will attack and which will defend. Each side is on a 24-hour alert. Orders flash out. An attack is launched. Reinforced by Danish, Norwegian, British, and American forces, the second Allied Tactical Air Force blasts the enemy with a thunderous attack. Twelve installations of the defending fourth Allied Tactical Air Force are hit, four of them by simulated atomic bombs. The defending air force is staggered, but not defeated. Greek, Turkish, Italian, and other Allied squadrons come to the aid of the defenders. Together they hit back, and the vast air battle rages over Europe in exercise carte blanche. Norwegian and Danish air defenses were tested in September maneuvers in exercise strong enterprise. Danish ground troops defended the island of Zealand against invasion. First, British commandos land at a secret rendezvous point along the coast. Then, from bases in the United Kingdom, British paratroopers fly to the attack. Their mission, to destroy vital installations. Aiding the invaders in the landing at Corsor are Danish frogmen. Promptly at dawn, amphibious forces land and establish a beachhead with the aid of air and naval support. Defending airmen strike back with a mock atomic attack on the invading fleet. The invasion grinds to a stop. Danish ground forces follow up with aggressive counterattacks. They pierce the beachhead, bringing the exercise to a close. Exercise Cordon Bleu was the climax of the year's NATO maneuvers. All phases of the maneuver come under the close inspection of senior officers. They include Marshal Alpha Juan, Commander-in-Chief, Allied Forces, Central Europe. General Charles Nouare, Commander-in-Chief of French Forces in Germany, and General Adolf Poisinger, Chairman of the German Military Council. The battle area covers 12,000 square miles of hilly country in southwest Germany. The two opposing forces maneuver on a north-south axis. Aggressor consists of the American 2nd Armor Division, the French 1st Armor Division, and other smaller units. The U.S. 12th Air Force furnishes air support. Opposing them is a stronger defending force, including the French 7th Light Mechanized and 5th Armored Divisions, the U.S. 5th and 9th Infantry Divisions, and elements of the British 16th Parachute Brigade Group. The defending force is supported in the air by elements of the French 1st Tactical Air Command and by the U.S. 322nd Air Division. The maneuver opens at night as aggressor forces drive southward through Würzburg. Defenders lose ground, but manage to regain air superiority. They throw powerful weapons into the battle to stop the advance. Using the Honest John rocket and the powerful 280 millimeter atomic cannon. All day long, the fighting is hard. Then the defenders launch a counterattack on a 50 mile front, stopping the aggressor drive. At this point, British paratroopers are thrown into the battle. They establish a bridgehead along the Main River. Aggressors do not let up in their attack. 
The next 36 hours, the advantage goes to one side, then the other. Finally, French tanks reach the paratroopers. The aggressor is forced back. Heavy use is made of atomic weapons. The U.S. 5th Infantry Division is twice hit by simulated atomic missiles, but the division is able to continue fighting. Defenders cross the Mine River at four points. The French 7th Mechanized Division breaks the back of the aggressor resistance in a flanking movement. Exercise Corte Bleu comes to a close with defenders driving northward for a total of 80 miles. Maneuvers, of course, are held on both sides of the Iron Curtain. We can only speak for our side. The training gained by men of all ranks is tremendously valuable and has this important result. NATO has developed a powerful and flexible defense organization. It can react swiftly to any aggression. Its military strength and unity represent a guarantee of peace. For it is doubtful that an aggressor would risk an attack knowing that self-destruction would be its certain result. Yes, realistic maneuvers maintain the NATO forces in fighting trim and strengthen the defenses of Western Europe. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us again next week for another look at your army in action on the big picture. The big picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the army at home and overseas. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center, presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station. You, too, can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army.